Good morning. It is a pleasure to see everyone here this morning. We have some visitors who have come our way. It is always good when we have visitors here at North Beach. If you are visiting with us, we do hope that you have been made to feel welcome in our assembly, and we do hope that you will be made to feel even more welcome before you leave this morning. And certainly to our visitors, let me say that if you have some questions about what we do here at North Beach Church of Christ, we would welcome the opportunity to answer those questions. Or maybe you are here this morning and you have some questions about God, about Jesus Christ, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would welcome as well the opportunity to answer those questions. At the conclusion of services this morning, I will be in the foyer. Uh, Other men will be there as well. Uh, Our elders are usually there in the foyer. And so if you have some questions that you'd like to address, please go up to just any one of us. Let us know that you've got some questions and we'll make all the arrangements necessary to answer those questions. Again, we are glad that you are here with us this morning. I will also say at the beginning of this lesson that at the end of this lesson, Aaron is going to lead us in a song. And Aaron, I have to confess that I was really hoping to hear your voice crack there. And I think you kind of hit an octave lower or something on that to avoid that, but it didn't happen. Uh, But I can appreciate how hard it can be to lead singing or preach when your voice is not what it needs to be. And I appreciate Aaron leading those songs this morning. But at the conclusion of this lesson, he's going to lead us in another song that he's already announced. During that song, the congregation is going to stand for that song. At that time, I'm going to go back to the foyer. If you are here this morning and would like to get your life right with God, maybe you'd like to be baptized to have your sins washed away. Maybe you are here this morning and you've already done that but need the prayers of the congregation. Then during that song, I'd invite you to come back there and talk with me and we'll sit down together in a classroom and talk about what it is that you need to do this morning. And I'll remind you of that as we get to the end of the lesson, but I wanted to say that now so that you have some time to think about that as we study in God's word this morning. I do hope that you will take your Bibles and follow along as we conclude, as we conclude a series of lessons that we began Seven weeks ago, I guess it would be eight weeks ago. This is the eighth lesson and final lesson in the series on the fruit of the Spirit. Way back at the beginning of this year, our elders decided that the congregational theme for 2023 would be growing in Christ. And we have addressed that periodically from the pulpit as the year has gone by. But I wanted to conclude this year with this particular series of sermons because I believe that for us as Christians, the fruit of the Spirit is vitally important for us if we are going to grow and be the kind of disciples that Jesus would have us to be. In Matthew, in, in, not in Matthew, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, we read about the fruit of the Spirit, 22 and 23. I have it there on the screen behind me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we have looked at all of those in this series, except for the last one on the list, which is self-control. And so in the time that we have this morning, I'd like for us to spend a little time talking about self-control. And I have to tell you that in this list, everything in that list is important for us. And everything in that list is vital for us as Christians to put into practice. But I'm going to suggest to you this morning that in our particular time and in our particular society, the issue of self-control is one that we vitally need to think about. Because I would suggest to you today that we live in a society that is completely out of control. And people are out of control. And we have a lot of issues in our society with self-control not being practiced. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the lesson as we look at some specific and concrete areas in which disciples should exercise self-control. But as we look at the fruit of the Spirit... And go back to a slide that I have used with some variation in every single one of these lessons. As we look at the fruit of the Spirit, we need to understand that the fruit of the Spirit is something that should be visible in our lives. These are not some kind of esoteric ideas that we just kind of sit around a campfire, if you will, and kind of share opinions and thoughts back and forth about these things. No, when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, we're talking about things that should absolutely be visible in our lives. Let me say it differently. These are things that we as Christians should be 
practicing in our lives. What we also find as we look at the fruit of the Spirit is that it is something that should be increasing in our lives. I would invite you to look with me, if you would, in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read verses 5 through 8. These are not verses that talk about the fruit of the Spirit as such, but they give us, they give us a principle that I think is important for us to remember. So in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, Peter writes this. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. And by the way, if I wanted to preach another long series of lessons on attributes that Christians should demonstrate, there would be a really good listing of it right here. But I won't do that, at least not anytime soon. Now notice verse 8. Peter says, for if these qualities are yours... And are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The fruit of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, is something that should be visible. As we look at gentleness and kindness and love and the other things that are on that list, they are things that should be visible and they are things that should be increasing in our lives. It is not enough for us as disciples to remain static at some point, at some level, if you will, in our lives with Jesus. This is not a video game where we should be content to stay on level 20. The life of a disciple is the life that says we will push onward and upward to achieve more and more as disciples in the kingdom. And so they should be increasing in our lives. And I have also presented the thought, and I'll present it again very briefly again this morning, that the fruit of the Spirit is produced by the Holy Spirit working in us, which He does through his word. And so if we want to grow in the fruit of the spirit, we need to spend time in the information that God has revealed through the Holy Spirit, which we find in our Bibles. I cannot emphasize enough, and I'm emphasizing now for the last time, how important this is. These qualities are qualities which God expects to find in us. God expects not only to find the qualities in us, he expects to see that other people find the qualities in us, and he expects to see that these qualities are increasing in our lives. We cannot grow as disciples if we are not growing in these things. So having said all of that, we're going to begin now for a little while talking about the last aspect, the last characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. This is an interesting word that's used here in Greek. It appears only seven times in the New Testament in various grammatical forms. And so seven times in the New Testament is all that we find this word. And we're going to look at several of them this morning. The analytical lexicon of the New Testament defines this word that's used as self-control, especially in matter related to sex. So sexual morality, if you will. The uh, different uh, dictionary, the exegetical dictionary of the New Testament defines it in this way. It says in all instances, this word, this Greek word refers first of all to sexual abstinence, but then is extended. And I want you to note the extension is extended to include positive general self-control and discipline. So we see that that Paul uses a word here that in its basic form talks about self-control in one particular area, sexual morality. But that that word has an expanded meaning that includes many other areas of our life. General self-control, general discipline. And we see the word used in this way in the scriptures. And so as we look at this, and if you'll take your Bibles and go with me over to 1 Corinthians, even though these passages will be on the board, you might want to look in your Bibles yourself. In 1 Corinthians, we see it used in both sentences. So in chapter 7, in chapter 7, verses 8 and 9 in 1 Corinthians, we see this, to the unmarried and the widows, 
I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 and 9, and 9 in particular, Paul uses the word in its, its original or its basic form, if you will, that it, re- that it refers to self-control concerning sexual morality. And so Paul says what? He says in this regard, I'm writing this to unmarried and widows people, widowed people, people who are not in a marriage. It is good if you can remain single as he was, but if you cannot exercise self-control in terms of sexual morality, then it is better to get married. In fact, he says they should marry if they cannot exercise self-control. That is that first sense of the word. But there in 1 Corinthians, we see that Paul uses it in the other sense as well. And so if you'll look in chapter 9, in chapter 9, Paul writes this. He says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, wreath, I'm sorry, but we an imperishable wreath. We're going to come back to this verse at the end of this lesson this morning. But I just want you to notice that what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 doesn't really have anything specifically to do with sexual morality. It did in chapter 7. It doesn't here. Paul is using the exact same word two times in the exact same letter and we get the full spectrum of its meaning. It is self-control. It involves discipline. It involves, brothers and sisters, being in control of ourselves. And there are some areas, there are some areas that really, really require self-control. And so we're going to look at several of these this morning. And this is really going to take the bulk of my lesson today. Areas in which we as Christians... And sometimes we as Christians, particularly in 2023, soon to be 2024 America, need to exercise self-control. Take your Bibles and go with me, if you would, to the Old Testament, to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. In Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 11, we have a verse that tells us one of the areas in which we should exercise self-control, and that is the area of emotions. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 11, I'm going to give you time to find that, because if I don't, I'll read it and we'll be done before you get there. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 11, a fool, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. We read here in Proverbs about the idea of controlling emotions. And so we read that a fool does what? A fool gives full vent to his spirit. Whatever it is he thinks, whatever it is he feels like saying, whatever it is he feels like doing, he just does it. This is the guy that mouths off immediately in every set of circumstances. He says the first thing that comes to his mind. But the second part of the verse, a wise man does what? Quietly holds it back. He keeps it under control. We have probably all been in situations where someone has provoked us in some way. Maybe we've had a bad morning. Maybe we haven't had our second cup of coffee or our third cup or however many you drink in the morning. And we encounter some situation or some individual and without thinking, we immediately respond. And probably we spend a couple of hours after that saying, man, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I had reacted differently because we didn't hold back what we thought. Wisdom, wisdom, a wise man will quietly hold his emotions in check. We understand how this works, don't we? We have some toddlers here in the room, including my grandson. We understand how this works with toddlers. Toddlers throw temper tantrums, don't they? If you've got a toddler that doesn't throw temper tantrums, you truly have a blessing. Because most do. Because they are not in control of their emotions. What do we try to do as parents? We try to direct them or redirect them, if you will, so that they come to understand that throwing temper tantrums simply is not acceptable behavior. Sometimes we as adults 
throw temper tantrums as well. We need to exercise self-control in regards to our emotions. And going right along with that, if you will take your Bibles and go to the book of James in the New Testament. James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, going right along with that, James talks about controlling our words. James chapter 3, let's look together starting in verse 2. James chapter 3, starting in verse 2, James writes this. He says, For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Let me say this. Let me just kind of reiterate what James is saying here. He uses two examples. He uses a horse and the fact that a horse has a bridle in its mouth. And when you have a bridle in a horse's mouth, you have that animal under control. If you want to go right, you pull right. If you want to go left, you pull left. If you want to stop, you pull both up. And the horse is going to obey because he's got that bridle. He's got that bit in his mouth. He's going to do what? So he's a big animal. Incredibly strong and powerful. Far stronger and more powerful than any of us individually. And yet any of us, even someone, Josiah, sorry to pick on you, even someone small like Josiah can control a horse that is 20 times his size and strength. James's other example here is a ship. A ship has a rudder on it. The pilot has a wheel. He turns that rudder whichever way he wants to go, and that's the way the ship is going to go. Something small that has, an, a, big, has a big effect. James then says what? Verse 5 again. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Notice verses 9 and 10. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. The tongue is an incredibly powerful member of our bodies. It can be used to great good and it can be used for great evil. Brothers and sisters, we need to be in control of our tongues. I will tell you frankly something about me. There are some things that are never a problem in my life. If someone were to come up to me and offer me cocaine or marijuana or some other drug like that, even if it were legal, those things would not tempt me in the slightest bit. I would not be interested. My problem lies elsewhere. And one area in which I have to exercise a great deal of self-control is my tongue. And maybe you are in those set of circumstances as well. Certainly, James says that many of us are. In fact, he says, in reality, all of us are to some extent or another. We encounter a world around us full of people, many of whom will from time to time irritate us. Brothers and sisters, we encounter people in this very room who will irritate us. I have probably irritated some of you and rest assured, some of you have irritated me. How do we deal with that? We deal with that by exercising self-control. We exercise self-control in both of those areas you see on the screen, in terms of our emotions and in terms of our words. It is vitally important because great damage can be done when we do not. Let me just stop here for just a minute because sometimes we think about this in regard to our temper, if you will, to our emotions. But can I suggest to you that we need to exercise self-control concerning our words when it comes to things like gossip as well. Talking about other people. Talking about other people, not to those people. 
We need to be careful in this regard. We as Christians need to be really careful in this regard because churches have been split, souls have been lost, and gospel evangelism has not been done because of the sin of gossip and sins of the tongue in general. We need to exercise self-control. If you will, take your Bibles. Let's look, at a couple, let's look at another example of an area. We need to exercise self-control when it comes to money. Look with me, if you will, in Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. And look with me at verse 20. We're also going to look in 1 Timothy. But let's start in the Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 21. Verse 20. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling... But a foolish man devours it. Do you understand what is being written about here in Proverbs? He says, a wise man will have what? He will store up, he will have treasure and oil. But a foolish man just devours everything. We would say it differently. A foolish man lives as if he has got holes in his pocket. The money goes in and then it's gone and it's just gone. It's just like he lost it somewhere and doesn't even know where it is interesting to me that as soon as my children went to college the mail started not the college mail the credit card application mail one after another where they would offer young people a great deal of money and guess what you don't have to pay it back anytime soon you can just make monthly payments and back a few years ago, interest rates were high, but they weren't that high. Do you realize that interest rates on credit cards right now are around 25%? People get into credit card debt, it is virtually impossible to get out of that. And so people end up doing things like declaring bankruptcy, which then makes it difficult for them down the road as well financially. But what credit card companies know, and they know it very well, they are the cigarette companies of the financial world. They know that when you get people hooked, you've got them. And that's what they do. And they send applications to young people who have not yet developed the wisdom to know, I don't need that. Sometimes it isn't just young people that have this problem. We go through money, we just spend it all we just devour it. The writer here in Proverbs says there is a difference between a wise man and a foolish man when it comes to money. Take your Bibles and go with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 6, to the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look with me starting in verse 9. And notice what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, but those, this is 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9, but those who desire to be rich. If you underline in your Bibles, underline that word desire to be rich. Fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, verse 10, is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Paul does not say... Those who are rich fall in temptation. That may be true, but it is not what Paul says. Paul says those who desire to be rich. And then he says in verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. We need to exercise self-control in terms of money. While I'm ranting about things this morning, ranting about credit card companies, I will rant now against the lottery and against gambling. And this is not a lesson on those things, although I certainly could do that. When the Powerball jackpot hits however many hundreds of millions it will eventually hit. That's all that's talked about on the morning news. The Powerball reached this much. And then the next day it reaches even more. Do you know why it reached even more the next day? Because everybody's out buying lottery tickets because they want to win that half a billion dollars. Brothers and sisters, if you feel tempted to waste your money... Because you've got more than you need. Go back in the hallway and look on the board at the men we support. Choose one of them. Send your money to him. And it will not be wasted. And it will not come back to you empty. But going down and buying a lottery ticket in the desire that you're going to be the one to be rich. Brothers and sisters, the biblical word for that is covetousness. 
That's why gambling is wrong. Because it is a desire to be rich at the expense of others. Because the only way there's 500 million in that jackpot is because there were 499 million other people who bought a ticket and contributed their money to you. Shouldn't be an issue for us as Christians if we understand God's attitude towards money and money being under control and us exercising self-control in that regard. Another area that requires self-control for us as Christians is the area, this gets us to the root meaning of that word, the area of sexual sins. Take your Bibles and go with me. We're going to look at two passages, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, let's look together, verses 27 through 30. This is also a great evil in our society. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right hand causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. The adage of the advertising world is that sex sells. And it does. And so you will find explicit images being used to advertise all sorts of products that have nothing at all whatsoever to do with the image being used. I remember there is a company in the Czech Republic, this has always struck me as a classic example. A company in the Czech Republic that sells windows, like you have in your house. Windows, okay? Their advertisement is a window on their van, painted, with a woman in the window, half leaning out, and brothers and sisters, she is wearing nothing. Not a swimsuit, nothing. How in the world has that got anything to do with selling a window? I don't know. But guess what? I remember the van still today, and so do a whole lot of other people. And by the way, the Czech Republic passed laws forbidding that, finally. So they had to change, or will have to change their picture. But we see it all around us. We are faced with temptation on every turn. Whether it be pornography, whether it be billboards, it is all around us. Jesus says what? Everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so he gives hyperbole here and says what? If you can't deal with this, it is better to be blind than to sin in this regard, and that is hyperbole. Please, no one go home this morning and pluck out your eye. That is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying we need to exercise self-control. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, Paul says this. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Don't walk away. Don't stay near by it. He says, flee from it. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Let me just stop here for a minute and say this. There are just some things in the world that we don't want to have around us. If I walk out on the back porch of my house and there's a rattlesnake curled up out there, guess what? With all due deference to the city of Fort Worth, there's going to be a firearm discharge because I'm going to kill that snake. I'm not going to pick it up in a shovel and relocate it. I'm not going to call an animal rehabber. It's going to die. Shouldn't have been on my porch. And if there's a black widow, I'm not going to use my gun for that, but I'll kill that black widow too. Because I don't want that anywhere near me or around me because they're dangerous. I'm not going to think that somehow I and that rattlesnake can coexist on my back porch. It's not going to happen. But that's what we do, isn't it? With sexual immorality, we want to cozy up to it, get as close to it as we can without realizing that it is the rattlesnake that bites and is fatal. So Paul says, flee from sexual immorality. Don't be around it. Verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For, if you, were, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Bought 
with a price. The price paid was Jesus' own blood. We have a huge problem in our society with all of the things on the screen. We have a huge problem in our society, particularly in regards to this. And we need to exercise self-control. Finally, in regards to this, another area in which we as a society have a huge problem. Let's look in Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23 Let's look together at verses 20 and 21. My last point on the slide, then I'm going to make some other points and we're going to wrap up for this morning. We need to exercise self-control when it comes to food. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 20. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and slumber will clothe them with rags. Can I... Just say this. Probably everybody in this room would look at that first phrase and see, be not among drunkards. Oh, absolutely. There's nothing more silly in the world than a man who is so drunk he cannot even stand up on his feet. And we look at that with disdain and say, well, boy, how are you dominated by that? And then we will go to our potlucks or Texas Day Brazil and we will commit the sin of gluttony there. Notice with me, if you will, the writer puts the two together in one passage. One is respectable in our society. The other is not. It's hard in America to exercise self-control in terms of food. Because we have it all. And we have it in abundance. And until fairly recently, it's been pretty cheap. To eat as much as you want, of what you want, whenever you want day after day. And so waistlines expand. But let us not fall into the trap of thinking that just because a man is skinny or a woman is skinny that she is not involved in this either. We need to exercise self-control. I'm going to finish with going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Because we look at this and we say, well, how is it that we... I mean, it's nice to say it, but how do we actually exercise self-control. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 through 27 are our verses. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, that'll be great, but they will also be up here on the screen. Again, Paul says this, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Notice my underlining or highlighting of that word. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we are imperishable. You can underline that word as well. What is Paul talking about here? He's talking about that an athlete that is running lives with a purpose. They're a runner. That's what they do. They want to have that purpose. Prize. And so they think about the end goal of the race. They keep that ever before them. Brothers and sisters, can I suggest to you this morning that when it comes to self-control, we need to keep the prize before us. The prize is the eternal inheritance in heaven. When finally, finally, we get to go home and be with God. And all the trouble of life passed and once again with the Father. Then he continues here in the text and he says, So, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Living with purpose and then living with discipline. We need both. Friday morning. I had, for the first time in my life, and probably the last time in my life, I got to meet, quite by accident, two Olympic athletes from two different countries. One that plays on our team, and one that plays on the team of of Slovakia, a foreign country. And it was quite by accident that I got to meet them. And I even got to watch one of them practice. They were uh, skeet shooters. And so they were shooting shotguns. And what I noticed about these, these are the first Olympians I've ever met in my life, is these are people who do what? They live with a purpose. What's their purpose? What does every Olympic athlete want? He wants gold. He wants to be top in his category or her category in every single event. And it doesn't matter whether it's sports shooting or whether it's 
100 yard dash or whatever it is. And I just, you're, my, my ignorance of sports is coming out there. Everyone wants to win gold. And if you can't win gold, you want silver. And if you don't get silver, you want bronze. But everybody wants to place. And so they do what? They train. And they train. And they train again. And they train some more. And they discipline themselves. Both of these athletes clearly spend a lot of time at the gym training and disciplining their bodies so that they can compete. Their purpose is to win the prize. Their purpose is to make the team and bring home gold for the honor of themselves and for the honor of their country. And they do that, they achieve that with discipline. I will never be, never, it'll never happen. I will never be able to shoot skeet like they do. There isn't enough money in the world to have me out on the range enough of the day to actually make that happen. But brothers and sisters, Christ calls upon us to go for the gold, to bring glory and honor to him and to his kingdom. And in order to do that, we've got to train in self-control, to be the kind of disciples that Jesus wants us to be and that God expects us to be. Living with purpose, living with discipline. That's what self-control is is all about. I appreciate your attention this morning. Thank you for your attention during this series of lessons. I hope that they have been beneficial to you. They have certainly been beneficial to me as I've prepared and as I've presented them. We are at that time in the lesson, time in the service, where we're going to sing that song that I talked about earlier. Aaron is ready to lead us in that song over there. If you are here this morning, would like to talk with me about getting your life right with God. The congregation is going to stand and sing. I'm going to go back to the foyer. Come see me there. We'll talk together. I'd invite you to do that now while we stand and while we sing.